Hello and welcome to Base Day F. You know me, I'm sociologist Ashley Frawley. With me today, I have D.L. Jacobs. I could give you a whole front-loaded bio, but I often get it wrong. So <laughs> um, who are you and why should we listen to you today? Uh, so first off, I'm a fan of the show, a fan of Ashley. And so I had been planning on um, kind of giving a teaching about this, uh, but I know that Ashley is very interested in you know, political economy and the history of political economy, and also that you have found it to be very crucial to questions about transforming the world and changing the world and emancipating people. Um, and so yeah. I thought it would be important to kind of talk about maybe what sometimes is a, um, a unknown or kind of almost, almost fell into oblivion aspect of the history of political economy that had a huge importance for Marx specifically about organizing and really like politics, even though it's going to sound like I'm talking about economics today. So I thought it would be important to come on and discuss this because when we think about ways in which we might be able to seek an emancipatory form of politics today, uh, maybe it's not going to be through Ricardian socialism, but there might be an insight into what Marx tried to do with the Ricardian socialists, what they represented to him that could maybe put our, our finger or point on an emancipatory left form of politics today. That's excellent. That's so exciting. And and obviously, you know that um, my obsession is political economy. At the moment, I'm doing this huge deep dive that's just totally got away from me on the whole history of value and money. And I'm trying to, I was like, well, where do you start? And I'm like, hominids. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so easy for it all to kind of get away from you. So where would you... Where would you start? So you wanted to do a teach-in, right? Um, and the the point is to kind of get um, get people to understand that um, what that Marx was turning political economy into the expression of a workers' uh, movement, uh, to, uh, the, a whole history of the working class coming to understand itself. If I got that kind of correct, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how, where would you start this kind of, where does political economy begin to become kind of conscious of, of, of where it's going? Yes. If that's the right question. And no, that's a great question. And it kind of opens up with, um, Adam Smith. I wanted to start with actually a quote by Marx on Adam Smith, and then we okay. can kind of work to, um, how Adam Smith thought about things. So at the end of a section, uh, in theories of surplus value, this is a large book that Marx wrote. It's often considered a history of economic thought. I'm going to try to, you know, hopefully make an argument today that there's a point to why Marx is going through all of these um, unknown or just not very well known um, uh, philosophers of, of political economy. And it's important to remember that Adam Smith considered himself a moral philosopher going to this question about the consciousness of political economy. So Marx ends the section by saying, Adam Smith's contradictions are of significance because they contain problems which it is true he does not solve, but which he reveals by contradicting himself. His correct instinct in this connection is best shown by the fact that his successors, and I'm going to talk about them today, take opposing stands based on one aspect of his teaching or the other. So this instantly raises this question about Adam Smith. Um, why is he this figure that I want to start with, because isn't someone like William Petty or the physiocrats or even earlier people, David Hume, who was a friend of Adam Smith, you could start there with, I guess, modern concepts of political economy. Smith for Marx and really for people even of Smith's contemporaries, like Immanuel Kant, the really you know genius philosopher, was kind of giving the consciousness of the modern task of freedom. Right. We can even imagine almost 50 years before Hegel's writing his lectures on the philosophy of history. And of course, Hegel read Adam Smith when he was in Jena, that Smith is basically saying, what is this world that has come into existence? And how is it putting a kind of need on people that kind of demands a clarification of what kind of society we live in and how we ought to live? This is why Adam Smith is often considered part of the Enlightenment, meaning Adam Smith does not invent bourgeois society or modern urban society. He reflects on what is implied in how we live and how the day laborer and the cobbler live. 
and how we ought to live. So when Marx says, you know, and has, you know, says Smith's contradictions, this is actually not a critique of Smith. For Marx, Adam Smith's genius, he says Adam Smith has an exoteric and an esoteric side, was precisely through how he moved through a naive contradiction and allowed modern society's contradiction in essence of in appearance to actually push the demands of his time. So again, going back to my point about Adam Smith is trying to clarify what modern society is, what it means. For Marx, who picked up on this, this is why Adam Smith had to appear to contradict himself through different parts of his Wealth of Nations, his book. So I'm going to quote Marx, um, who will kind of get into this. On the one hand, Adam Smith attempted to penetrate the inner physiology of bourgeois society. But on the other, he partly tried to describe its externally apparent forms of life for the first time to show its relations as they appear outwardly. And partly, he had even defined a nomenclature and corresponding mental concepts for these phenomena, i.e. to reproduce them for the first time in the language and in the thought process. The one task interests him as much as the other, and since both proceed independently of one another, the results in completely contradictory ways of presentation. The one expresses the intrinsic connections more or less correctly, right? This is like the esoteric Smith. This is when he's penetrating into the metaphysical aspect of modern society, that it's beyond what's empirical, what you can touch, what's tangible. Um, the other, with the same justification and without any connection to the first method approach, expresses the apparent connections without any internal relation. Adam Smith's successors, insofar as they do not represent the reaction against them of an older and obsolete methods of approach, can pursue their particular investigations and observations undisturbedly and can always regard Adam Smith as their base, whether they follow the esoteric or exoteric part of his work, or whether, as is almost always the case, they jumble up the two. What was contradictory about society for Smith was not a negative. Like, I think, you know, we're used to hearing contradiction and it's like you're catching your opponent in an argument. Like, Ashley, you said this, and now you said this. Ha ha, I got you. That's a fallacy. But contradiction was an expression of freedom, of possibility. In other words, you know, like Hegel runs with this basically in all of his works, that the one-sidedness of any form is constantly pointing beyond itself, right? And it's pointing to the general social totality. And the way in which Smith kind of starts at different aspects of modern society in, say, book one of Wealth of Nations, where he's kind of starting with just an isolated laborer who's like hunting deer or beaver. And then in the second part, he's starting with people exchanging. What's kind of brilliant about Smith is that he's dialectically entwining all of these. And it's coming to a consummation. Usually people don't talk about this when they talk about Wealth of Nations. In book four, when he's saying the crisis of the British Revolution, the English Revolution, is manifesting in the contest of in America and in India, right? In the subjugation of India to the East India Trading Company, that the far ends of the English Revolution, right? The Great Rebellion, Cromwell, right? Like the levelers, all of this stuff is manifesting in that what maybe looked like a local event in the 17th century is actually a cosmological change. And this is why Adam Smith is already giving a critique of political economy. So we know that, you know, economics and, you know, Ashley knows much more Greek than I do. I don't know any Greek, but I believe going back to Xenophon, right? Economia, that there's always been this term for, for economy. And it was usually put at the level of like household economy. You know, people still do this today, like in high school, so it'll be um, home ec or something like that. But, you know, and there was an idea of a division of labor. You should divide up the, the slaves that are working on the, um, you know, plantations uh, in order for them to be more productive. But what Smith is getting at is kind of the deep aspect of what has transformed the very nature of humanity in the last 500 years when he's writing. So I, I just am going to quote from the end of book three from Adam Smith. 
A revolution of the greatest importance to the public happiness was in the manner brought about by two different orders of people who had not the least intention to serve the public. To gratify the most childish vanity was the sole motive of the great proprietors. The merchants and artificers, much less ridiculous, acted merely from a view to their own interest and percent pursuit of their own peddler principle of turning a penny wherever a penny was to be got. Neither of them had either knowledge or foresight of that great revolution which the folly of one and the industry of the other was gradually bringing about. So this is already, like again, you know, Hegel is six years old at this time. This is in 1776. Already Adam Smith is saying, you know, consciousness has worked behind the backs of self-consciousness. That Adam Smith, you know, if you turn the page and you're in book four, he starts off with systems of political economy. And Adam Smith is saying, why are all these systems of political economy existing? Oh, they're all expressions of this revolution that's come about by which the development of a commercial society, this revolution that began in the cities, Right. This is why I keep saying bourgeois society. Bourgeois is urban. My dad is from Brooklyn, New York. He's from one of the boroughs of New York. That's urban society has remade the world. That this kind of revolution there has transformed the world. And it's actually imposed itself upon the Duke of Saxony and choose your favorite feudal lord who all of a sudden have to consider these questions of like commerce. William Petty, when he starts off his famous political arithmetic, you know, like they wrote gigantic chapter titles in the 17th century, so it would just be one long sentence. And he basically says, why is it possible for a land poor country that is sparsely populated to defeat the invincible armada of Spain? He's talking about England, right? Like why can England defeat the Spanish armada? How is that possible? Oh, he's saying what's being revealed by modern commercial society is that they can grow wealthy. Even if you have like, you know, it's like English weather. It's like rain, sparsely populated, cheap eating men. That used to be the phrase. That's, I know that's later. But um, it's just one of these things that a social power is impressing itself upon people. But it's impressing in very one-sided ways as, oh, the country that seems to have a lot of money seems to be the most powerful. Da, 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 mercantilism, like obviously, right? These things make sense. Or the physiocrats in France, right? Bourbon France, which is powerful. How are they so p powerful? They have the lush land of France, you know? Of, I don't know, choose your favorite like wine country. It's like Burgundy or something. And so they can raise humongous armies because they get the free gift from nature. So you're getting all of these systems of political economy. But Smith... Um, you know, he's like an early fan. And actually, I know you're reading this person currently, Rousseau. So Adam Smith writes, he's probably maybe the first English translator of Jean-Jacques Rousseau of the Discourse on Inequality, which I recommend everybody listening to have a, to read through and really, you know, struggle with. You have to like let Rousseau's dialectic, who he's really the modern originator of the modern social dialectic. And you don't have to believe me. You can believe Engels, Plakhanov, and Lenin, and Marx, who all say that in different works. And Hegel, in his History of Philosophy, says it dawns with Rousseau. And Adam Smith reads Rousseau and writes this letter into his, into the Edinburgh Review. And he's like, look, I thought the Scottish were the enlightened. But this guy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he's on to something. And just a few years later, so Wealth of Nations is published in 1776. But I think in the 20th century, they discovered an early draft of Wealth of Nations that I would like to quote from. Um, because I think Adam Smith's like a little bit more blunt in the, the question that he's, he's raising. Um, actually, before I quote that, let me just quote, let me quote the part that Adam Smith translates at the end of the Discourse on Inequality. For Adam Smith, the important part about Rousseau's Discourse on Inequality is that Rousseau has given this account of how we have basically emerged out of nature 
and that mankind, that what's most human is that we produce our own nature. We're the species that produces our own nature. So like if you're arguing with somebody on the internet and they say capitalism is human nature, you say, of course it is, and that's why we can change it. That's the like standard Rousseauian argument, right? Everybody already knows this. So at the end of the discourse on inequality, Rousseau says, um, whereas he calls it natural man, which is maybe something that's never existed, while well, they lived inside themselves, they lived according to their instinct, you can think of your favorite pet lives according to its instinct, although we've really affected pets. They're more, they try to talk to you. In other words, we, you can see the objectivity of human civilization on animals. Um, but nonetheless, modern man lives outside himself. And that was a very important point for Adam Smith. And I bring that up because for, you know, as, as Smith puts it in this early draft of Wealth of Nations, in the midst of so much oppressive inequality, this is Adam Smith, in the midst of so much oppressive inequality, in what manner shall we account for the superior affluence and abundance commonly possessed even by this lowest and most despised member of civilized society compared with the most respective an active savage can attain to. The division of labor by which each individual confines himself to a particular branch of business can alone account for the superior opulence which takes place in civilized societies and which, notwithstanding the inequality of property, extends itself to the lowest member of the community. In other words, Smith is asking, this is on the social contracts, not even published yet. And he's already asking, why would anybody accept this? Why would you accept the oppressive inequality of society? The reason I brought up on the social contract is because, of course, Rousseau starts off by talking about slavery and says, why is it that when the slaves fight off their slave master, chops their head off, whatever, throws them off a cliff, why is it that they don't go back into the state of nature? Because in a sense, they've already been transformed by institutions that they're, they're, they're human, right? I like to make this distinction between homo sapiens and humans, meaning what Rousseau and Adam Smith and the Enlightenment are discovering in the 18th century is that what is most human about us is something that's found in society. And that's, that's the meaning, therefore, of, of Rousseau saying modern man lives outside himself. And Adam Smith runs with this. Adam Smith might be more Rousseauian than Rousseau because he's instantly saying at the beginning of the Wealth of Nations that wealth is not the things that you have. It's not all the books that you have. It's not all the medals and things, but it's your access to the powers of society and the capacities, the freedoms of society. So he's already picking up on this point when he's talking about the lowest ranks of people. It's not one of these arguments that I guess Maggie Thatcher gives where it's like a rising tide lifts all boats, like, you know, this stuff, or like the Heritage Foundation that they says, shut up. Oh, poor people, you have refrigerators. So you're like wealthier. He's rather saying, and it's my favorite example when he talks about the wool coat of a day laborer in the first chapter of Wealth of Nations, that even the most basic necessity of a human requires the entire cooperation of the entire world. Right. When Smith, it's, it's like the longest run on sentence you've ever read in your life where he's like, oh, a woolen coat. Well, you need to get the wool. And that means you need like, you know, the sheep herder and the husbander and you need the sailors and you need the dyers and you need the people that can turn it into cloth and you need the shopkeeper. And, you know, contained in the most basic thing is this entire interdependence of society. And so what he's saying it's not like, oh, shut up, you have a nice life or something like that. He says oppressive inequality. This is Adam Smith. It's very Rousseau, by the way. This is why Rousseau wrote the discourse on inequality. Why is it that society doesn't collapse because it's unequal? Like, why don't everyone just chop each other's head off and go, this is totally bullshit? They're saying because the very conditions that went into even producing inequality meant the transformation of us from homo sapiens to humans. Think about inequality. I'll, I'll quote a young Marx. Young Marx, 
right? Writing on the uh, proceedings on the Rhine forest. Inequality is refracted equality. Bill Gates and I have very different money. I'm sure people know that. But Bill Gates and I are unequal because there's a third we both count as members of society. Right? There's a, there's a third thing here. So for Adam Smith, he doesn't say that entrepreneurial insight is the, res is the you know, reason for the wealth, but the division of labor which extends to everyone in society. We might put it in another way. Do the poor have an interest in the division of labor despite this oppressive inequality? So what Smith is asking is that for the division of labor to have emerged, it must have actually transformed everybody. He has all these great images. I, I love them because they're like, I don't know, Smith is like sentimental to me even. He talks about two children and they're like friends. And one of them grows up to be a philosopher and the other grows up to be a porter. Those are very different vocations. And obviously people have prejudices like, oh, the philosopher, you're like really knowledgeable. And a porter is somebody who carries bags. And it's like, you know, we, we judge people very differently. And he's like, but this difference is the result of the specialization that society affords. He's already getting it from research. You, don't, you can't be a philosopher in the state of nature. Are you crazy? Yeah, I'm going to sit on a rock and think about what is all day. I'm going to do this Aristotelian metaphysics. No, you have to hunt, right? The, the very necessity of nature is forcing you to be, to quote Smith, a jack of all trades. And so you never actually get to develop in any kind of manner. Something that I find very interesting about this is that um, some of the very earliest, the very, very earliest human settlements like Chattelhoek, they didn't seem to have enormous inequalities between people. But of course, bear in mind, only 5% of Chattelhoek has been, you know, excavated. But it's a similar kind of story in lots of very, very early settlements where people are sort of quasi hunter gatherers still, but they there's there's a transition. And you have like mother, you know, the famous Venuses, the mother, like uh, it seems to be some mm -hmm. kind of mother cult, something like that. Um, they worship fertility, fatness, this kind of thing. So, you know, feminists just love this. But very interestingly, mm -hmm. around 5,000 years ago, you have the um, a, a enormous drop off that's called the Y chromosome bottleneck. Are you familiar with that? It's it, it just basically means that something happened where the number of men reproducing dropped off enormously. Uh, uh, sorry, not 5,000 years ago, 5,000 BC. Um, so, and that's right around, so that uh, archaeologists think that this was, or physical anthropologists think that this was um, because of a um, the shift to patrilineal societies. And patrilineal societies mm. are useful for agriculture because some men will reproduce a lot and the other men go into the fields and, and go into the meat grinder, essentially. <laughs> it's not, it's not nice, yeah. but... But um, so you have this enormous inequality that came with the shift to patrilineal societies. And also you get the rise of the very first great civilizations, um, which in many ways is extremely yep. disturbing. <laughs> um, but also, you know, you got to feel bad for all that. Like patrilineal societies seem to have been a real bad thing for men. You know, like you have a Y chromosome bottleneck, like very few men start were reproducing after that point. And then you also sure. have the rise of great civilizations. So it's just interesting to me that this point about inequality being like being this, you know, terrible thing, but also a from the point of view, just sort of sitting back, not making a value judgment, it coincides with at least enormous leaps and bounds for humanity. Arguably, I don't know if you think civilization is good or not. <laughs> right. No, and, and so what's great about like Smith and Kant and all of these Enlightenment people is that they never affirm the society they're living mm. in. So I'm going to I'm going to bring up Kant later as well, because he's like totally Smithian influenced. I don't know why people write him off. By the way, theory of moral sentiments, the first fan of that is Immanuel Kant. Like Immanuel Kant is an early Adam Smith like yeah, that's my dude. I'm a fan of him. There's a letter of somebody saying, I think it's, um, I'll remember who it, who it is later, is like, oh, I heard you're really into Adam Smith. Like, Immanuel Kant. Kant's like, of course I am. It's, it's like his friends who are translating Adam Smith um, because he knows that the very, that philosophy is literally 
changing what it means because of this modern society. Because I know the phrase division of labor, how it's taught in schools, it's like the pin factory. This is the example that Adam Smith gives. And it's just kind of taught like, oh yeah, you're a little bit more productive, right? And it's like, everybody's known that for like, whatever, you just said 5,000 years, like 10,000 years. But like, yeah, of course, if we're making, you know, let's divide up, you do this, I'll do that. Me and my sister knew it when we were like a kid and we were like cleaning up after dinner. It's like, yeah, I'll do this part, you do this part. Everybody knows that. But he's talking about society. He's talking about how is there this specialization and how is this actually transforming even what it means to be a human? And if this is the case, how should things ought to be? So I'll, I'll take up the infamous line. You know, when you get these debates today, it's like Adam Smith is a libertarian and Karl Marx is a communist. Like I go, I go to these debates because just to waste time. And I just know if Marx walked in, he'd be like, what the hell is this? Like, I'm, I'm the Adam Smith fan. I'm, I have nothing against Adam Smith. Um, he writes a letter to Engels in 1851, and he says, there's been no progress in political economy since Smith and Ricardo. So he's like an Adam Smith guy. But Adam Smith, I guess famously or infamously says, when we, um, you know, exchange, we appeal to the self-interest of the other right? It's not by the benevolence of the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker, but we appeal to their self-interest. So for some reason, there's something called, I swear I am not making this up. You can Google it. Das, like it's a German thought, Das Adam Smith problem, that in his early theory of moral sentiments, it's about sympathy. And then they're like, but then Adam Smith writes Wealth of Nations and it's about self-interest. And so how this is interpreted today is that Adam Smith is like Gordon Gecko in The Wealth of Nations, and he's like Phil Donahue in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, right? He's like an altruist. All right, I'm going to say this for the audience. No, no. He's following Rousseau, right? In other words, the very condition of appealing to the self-interest of another presupposes being members of the same, of society, right? That we're both humans, that there's a third by which I can relate to you across difference. And of course, sympathy for Smith is just the translation of Rousseau's point about pity, right? So Rousseau mimicry, I like to put it as mimicry because all animals mimic. It's half of my YouTube like feed right now is just animals mimicking other animals. Like you've seen the video of the cat mimicking the horse and like the husky that was raised by cats, and so it kind of sits like a cat, right? This is all in nature. What Rousseau was getting at is that humans kind of developed by mimicking everything. We mimicked lightning by creating fire. We mimicked, you know, rotted fruit by creating alcohol. Um, you know, he has this image, Rousseau, of like, we're kind of weak, but we can imitate all these things. And out of this imitation, we kind of produced all of these implements. We mimicked each other. We related to each other. And so when Smith is writing really what he thought was his best work, which was the theory of moral sentiment, it's kind of curious that he thought that was his best work. He's saying all of morality has emerged out of our uh, mimicry of each other, of, out of sympathy. So he has this great story of like, you know, probably every couple that's arguing in America right now, it's like, do you understand me? No, you don't understand me. Do you understand me? Where Adam Smith is saying when friends talk about something that's happened to somebody, in that process, there's a way in which we develop the means of both relating to each other. So if I've had something really bad happen to me and I'm talking to a friend and they don't seem to get it, it the incong incongruity the non-identity actually makes me go, okay, I have to kind of put it into language that they understand. It actually makes you reflect and put yourself in the um, shoes of somebody else. And that even leads to different kind of views of virtue that, you know, like to be manly is to have something really bad happen to you, but not cry, that you can bring, that you can tone it down, right? Like it's like gentlemanly. It's like, yeah, I've had, I've seen stuff in war but I can relay it to my grandchildren. And I'm not like freaking out because I'm, it's a form of self-mastery. And that that self-mastery has been cultivated 
by learning how to relay stories and experiences to other people. Obviously, Immanuel Kant is just going to run with this in all three of his critiques, right? In other words, Kant is asking, how can experience be objective? Oh, in the realm of, he calls it rationality, this is also Hegel, in society, that society has actually allowed us to do things that go beyond our empirical finite being, right? You know, in other words, that um, language allows me to think of things that are not tangible. I talk about being, cause and effect. I, I, I've never seen a cause and effect running around in the forest, and yet it's a real thing, right? Literally, the, the realm of society is opening up to, quote Rousseau, alien powers. And the only reason one would enter into society and give up their natural liberty, it's out of freedom, out of the demand for freedom. So when Smith then starts off by talking about that the real wealth of everything is um, the productive powers of labor, for him, it's not about the things, it's about the possibilities and capacities that society affords us. That in society, we're able to develop in a manner that allows us to go beyond what would be afforded if we were, even if this has never existed, in an isolated state. And I can come back to that if that's something we, we want to clarify about the, the infamous state of nature thing. Like that, that's the, the first thing that anybody um, who knows yeah. anything about Marx on Rousseau will say. But maybe it's worthwhile to kind of... I'll, I'll defend it because mm. Marx defends it, right? Right at the first paragraph of the Grindrisa, he says, Smith and Ricardo are anticipating civil society. Meaning, yeah, like the infamous example that probably our, our college teachers do where they kind of like make a straw man of Adam Smith and Ricardo to knock him down. Oh, Robinson Crusoe, that's so dumb. Ha ha ha, I'm above that. Don't you know anthropology? No, no, no. The point is that it's an ideal of freedom, that it ought to be the case that if Ashley, you shot me through the black hole and I came out in another dimension, that I would take society with me. And why am I taking society with me? Because I'm a product of society. And it also expresses, a, it expresses a, yeah. the, self, the state of self-consciousness of society at that time. That it's, it's, it's an enormous yeah. leap that you, can all, you, that you can imagine an individual in isolation. Visit patreon.com slash Ashley A. Frawley for part two.